forest farm facilities and uh, the FR100 uh, uh, initiative. And uh, uh, we all together want to raise awareness on the best practices uh, on, uh, uh, on wood energy and uh, on the positive contribution that uh, sustainable wood energy could give to forest landscape restoration and uh, vice versa. As you uh, probably know, uh, the uh, 2.8 billion people in the world still rely on traditional biomass for cooking and uh, heating. They represent the, almost the 38% of the global population and uh, they are concentrated in non-OECD countries and especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So this means that uh, uh, wood fuel and uh, uh, charcoal uh, represent an important, uh, a relevant uh, factor for the well-being and for the food security of African people. So this is why uh, we um, can't miss this uh, important um, factor uh, while talking about forest landscape uh, restoration. Uh, let me uh, mm, briefly explain how this session will uh, flow. Uh, we will uh, have uh, uh, initially three keynote speakers uh, who will uh, explain the general uh, situation in terms of forest landscape restoration and uh, sustainable wood energy. And uh, after the three keynote speaker, we will have a panel discussion we will be, uh, which will be moderated by uh, Mrs. Nora Berramuni. Thank you, Mo Nora, for being here <laughs> again. I know that you have a very overwhelmed day, but you accept our invitation. Thank you so much. Nora is uh, a senior forestry officer at the F Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and uh, in the uh, regional office uh, of uh, uh, Africa, which is based here in uh, Accra. And uh, so during the panel <laughs> discussion, uh, we will have uh, Mamadou Diakite and uh, Mr. Shah Zuzang and uh, um, a representative from Forest and Farm Facility, Prague. And uh, uh, soon after, um, we uh, would like to receive your contribution and your best practices uh, via Slido. We have prepared uh, a, um, a Slido in order to receive uh, your best uh, practices. They will be all summarized uh, in the minutes of uh, uh, this event. So uh, thanks uh, uh, for coming, thanks for being here. And uh, let me leave the stage to Mamadou uh, Diakite who uh, is a senior manager uh, of the Sustainable Land and Water Management uh, of the African Union Development Agency of the New Partnership for Africa Development. Please, Diakite. I know that uh, I appreciate a lot your sacrifice. <laughs> I know that you're not feeling very well. <laughs> so. Thank you. Mamadou is also leading in this moment, uh, amongst the other, the African Forest and Landscape Initiative, AFR 100. Thank you very much, Mamadou. Thank you. Thank you, Tiziana. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. And uh, yes, I missed one session in the morning that was uh, facilitated by Nora and um, I will try my uh, best now. And Nora just reminded me that uh, actually for what I have, charcoal is uh, very good to, to, stabi to stabilize. So I, I will remember that, <laughs> that advice. So I will use some uh, wood and charcoal to, <laughs> to stabilize my, uh, my stomach. So um, um, I am here to, to just talk uh, to you briefly about the AFR 100. Uh, initiative and of course the linkage between the um, FLR forest landscape restoration and uh, wood energy and uh, I don't know if the presentation will go up uh, if, if possible um, but, um, I, but I can start uh, uh, as it is so the, uh, you may all know now by now the FR100 initiative which stands for Africa forest landscape restoration Initi initiative 
and uh, that was launched in uh, 2015 and by now we have 28 countries 28 african uh, countries that have joined this uh, initiative and um, um, who, who, who have now pledged for 113 million of hectare of uh, degraded land and forest to be restored by 2030 and um, uh, uh, we, we have um, um, so out of the uh, 28 countries we have started the assessment of um, uh, the status of degradation but also the um, the, um, the opportunities of restoration and as you may suspect uh, many of those countries we have so far I think 20 assessments that were completed and um, wood energy is uh, of course in the center of um, um, of their um, their request for support to to develop um, or maintain um, wood energy but that is sustainable to uh, with, with sustainable practices so and I think this is the added value that, that this kind of work collaboration can uh, can do to do sustainable uh, wood energy and bring bring it into the energy mix of countries. So I will not go into details because we only have five minutes per speaker, but this is more or less the the, the framework of um, the AFR 100. And uh, I will just insist on the, um, the national political ambitions, and this is where you see that uh, wood uh, energy will, will fit very, very well, and uh, of course with uh, support from the, the other pillars, the technical support, the um, global support, the multilateral support, and uh, also financial support in terms of investment from the uh, public uh, sector. So, yes, all these I, I I'm sure you know all these if you attended the AFR 100 and also the GLF um, uh, meetings, and um, all our work, our work program. I will not go into details. Can feed really into this um, this uh, this this initiative, and uh, also I would like to to finish the. Um, to f I would like just to, to finish quickly by saying that the NEPAD agencies has, has now moved to become the African Union Development Agency, AUDA. And why I'm telling you that, we have now set up um, an ambitious uh, energy program um, that is also linked to sustainable land and water management, that is linked also to restoration. And uh, that program on energy will focus in the next two, three years to come on the on 10 uh, african countries that have been identified with the least access to to energy and we have started deploying that program uh, three weeks ago in uh, burkina faso for the west african countries sierra leone liberia um, burkina faso niger and chad were there and we will have the same activity in uh, east africa and also in southern part of uh, of africa so really we invite your uh, expertise and your um, technical support to, to come and, and help the, those African countries to increase their, uh, their access to energy. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mamadou. Let me uh, call on the stage Mr. Sha Zunzang, who will represent uh, the uh, FAO Forestry Department. Uh, Sha is uh, a senior forestry officer at the FAO. She was uh, an expert in uh, energy and uh, in uh, uh, wood energy in particular. Thank you, Sha, for uh, your contribution. Hi, good afternoon. It's kind of challenging to make a presentation immediately after lunch. <laughs> also, I was given a very big topic and a very short presentation time. 
Now, originally we designed this topic, sustainable wood energy, I mean, 30 years of good practices, of sustainable wood energy in Africa. I think this topic deserves five days of discussions, not five minutes. But let me try to, 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 to present an overview of my findings on this subject. I tweet a little bit of, the, uh, of this, this topic from the wood energy to sustainable charcoal production and just better reflect our findings so far. It's an ongoing process. So first of all, why charcoal is a concern? Well, you may have your answers to these questions. Here are the my understanding. Why charcoal is a concern to us? According to FAO statistics, about half of the wood harvested from the forest are used directly as fuel. It's burned. You may not know this percentage. I mean, people believe that most wood used as timber, now actually half and half. Half are used as firewood for charcoal production, for wood pellet, or for wood chips. So this is a very big percentage. And in African countries, this percentage is even higher, up to 90%. Think about it. 90% of the wood harvested from the forest just burned for cooking and heating. But it's important. Without this wood, you know, how people cook their food? They do not eat raw. Also, about 17% of the wood is converted to charcoal. And this conversion process is not very efficient. I mean, the charcoal production in African countries account for roughly 60% of world charcoal production. So this means that you know, the charcoal production in this continent is very significant. So why? It is important. Why you know, people burn wood for cooking and heating? And if they collect it for their household, Mostly they collect from nearby forest. Or maybe you, they sell the forest to the cities or nearby, maybe dozens of kilometers away. But for charcoal, it may send hundreds of miles send charcoal to the big cities. So the impact, social, economic, environmental impact is much stronger than the decentralized wood fuel consumption by individual households. Think about in the big cities, it rely on charcoal, I mean, it's millions of population. So this impact can go far beyond the forest nearby and at the landscape level. And actually, you know, people wonder, well, this is an issue, like how many initiatives, the programs, in, and policies have been you know, addressing this. We're looking into this ever since 1980s. We found that a lot of interventions have been initiated. I mean, from the government level, from the international ODA, I mean, there's different funding sources, initiate programs or projects. And what are the lessons, experience, key findings of such programs? They're very much scattered here and there with the project report uh, with different languages. When you want to look into this particular issue, you try to summarize what the key findings so far. It's very time consuming. When I started working for FAO as a forestry, work, uh, forestry officer exclusively on wood energy, I tried to look into this firewood issues, charcoal issues, particularly in the African country, I found it really time consuming. That's why you know, we're trying to build up you know, some kind of information management system to see you know, how can we put these current findings together to easily find what has been done so far. Now this project information management system trying to house the information of relevant to charcoal and the wood fuels. And 
the target audience and stakeholders may include all of us, you know, policy, holder, uh, policy makers, um, the, the project uh, practitioners, uh, donor agencies. I mean, they are looking the, to, into this issue. You can quickly look into you know, the, for the particular country on the particular project, what have been done in this area. We're trying to have this kind of information available online. And this we are focusing on the initiative and interventions with uh, significant uh, large scale impact at national level because so many projects. If we look, you try to be inclusive to include everything is very, very challenging. So we look into the bigger project at the national scale. And also those with a bigger investment, I mean, it's likely have a bigger impact. Also have a major effort that occur over years. So this kind of project may have a larger uh, impact. This is the first priority we're looking into. And also, how to fund this? For initially, we, go this, we collect this information through internet search. But we also have partner organizations who can contribute to the process. And so we will open to the public. If you find something very interesting, very good, you may provide it into the system and after the manager review and clear it will be open to the public. So we plan to start with the uh, African countries, 50 plus countries, and eventually may cover other developing countries, uh, Asia and uh, uh, Latin America. So here is a sample of uh, fundings. I will not go through each and every of these, but this is just sample in the case of Zambia. Um, if you just try and look into the country of Zambia, what, yes, yes. What was relevant information, the sector review and uh, sector studies, the laws, policies, strategies, and program and project. And here's a, uh, one of the uh, particular projects, the Green Chaco project in Uganda. This is run by the UNDP and the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Department. Uh, it's a UNGP, UNDP GF supported project. So here is uh, the, you know, the year of start ending, the funding sources, and the references, the midterm review report. So this is the last slide. I mean, this is an uh, ongoing project. We, we have started, we have not yet finished. And so we start need to set up some kind of criteria to flag some best or good practices. When we put this into the system, we may look into you know, which one could be flagged as a good practice. So for good practices could be technically, socially, economically, or environmentally have a better performance. Or have some kind of improvement along any component of the charcoal value chains. Or it's kind of in you know, a better effective governance of the charcoal sector. So if any of these seems match, we will flag it as a possibly a good practice. And this kind of subjective we have started. And the preliminary findings so, so far is a wide range of efforts have been made in different countries and different sub-regions and towards the sustainable charcoal production. And many examples exist, I mean, towards the so-called sustainable charcoal production. And, but we found that most of these so-called good practices are very much, uh, very much site-specific or context-specific. There's no universally successful models that can be replicated somewhere else. But no, at least it's something good. And also, you know, if it's effective, very likely it's multiple interventions rather than just a simple one project intervention. And uh, lastly, with the structural changes could be very important. If no structural changes, it's less likely you will have the lasting impact for a long term. Thank you. I think in you know, five minutes is really very challenging, but I'm trying my, my best to give you an overview. I need your help. You, put your provide us your input. I put it into a system so I can help you back and help others. Thank you.
Thank you, Sha, for this wonderful intervention. Now, uh, after the senior officer, let me introduce the youth. Please, uh, Prague, come into the stage. Uh, Pragyan Pokrel is a second year Erasmus Mundus master's student. He works as a volunteer at the Forest Farm Facility, uh, which is a, a global uh, uh, organization supporting forest and farm producers' organizations. It's based, uh, the Secretariat is based at FAO in Rome. Please, Prag, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I come on behalf of the Forest and Farm Facility uh, until September I was involved with the Forest and Farm Facility and I'm still um, within the family of Forest and Farm Facility. Uh, I first stumbled upon the Forest and Farm Facility. Can I have my presentation up, please? Um, I first stumbled upon the Forest and Farm Facility as a younger forester uh, when I was out of, just out of university uh, working with IUCN in Nepal. And the first project I worked in was the Forest and Farm Facility in 2017 in its phase one. Um, then I went to university in Europe and then I got an opportunity to be engaged with the Forest and Farm Facility again in the headquarters. But I have a personal relationship with the Forest and Farm Facility as well. I'm also a young farmer, a generation of farmers. I belong to a family of generation of farmers from Nepal. Um, Forest and Farm Facility is a global partnership between FAO, IUCN, IIED, and AgriCorp. Uh, we have an objective to strengthen forest and farm producer organizations for forest climate resilient landscapes and improve livelihoods. Uh, we have four outcomes. Um, I wouldn't go into that. We work in 17 countries. We have nine core countries where we have our major work and we have uh, seven network countries where we're trying to leverage more funds so that we can scale up our work. Uh, since uh, we're in Africa, and like uh, I was in the plenary session before lunch, uh, most of the issues that were raised, like here's a solution to that. Uh, we have a strong focus on gender equality, youth involvement. We have strategies for gender and youth, and we work with indigenous communities. We, we have wonderful advocates in our panelists today who will tell you more about it, so I wouldn't take more time. Uh, we work directly with the forest and farm producer organizations in the ground, helping them to access finance, build capacity, share knowledge, among others. Uh, for the purposes of this interactive session, I want to highlight some of our work in Africa. In Kenya, we work with the uh, Zandewa Tree Growers Association. So a couple of months ago, we, we organized a farmer-led tree census program where we train farmers to inventory all the wood fuel potentials within their farm. Uh, in Liberia, we, we are working with the National Charcoal Union to strengthen their capacity. And in Zambia, as Humphrey will tell you more about it, we're working with uh, the Choma Charcoal Association and working in something called the Participatory Guarantee System, which is an organ, uh, which is a certification scheme between the farmers. Um, we have some of our challenges. For example, in Kenya, uh, there's a charcoal ban, so we have to work around it. Um, but I want to give, like, I have this, op I'm, of, I'm of the opinion that the people who actually work in the ground should get more time. So I, I leave it to that, and I thank you. And to my family of FFF back in Rome, uh, just so you know, I'm settling well in Germany, so don't worry. Thank you so much. I would like to thank a lot all of you for your contribution and if possible to call Nora on the stage to moderate the next panel uh, discussion. We will have also the contribution from all the, all the other panelists uh, uh, which comes from uh, uh, the civil society, ONG, representing other international organizations such as IRENA. So, uh, Nora, I will give you the floor, and uh, thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you so much, Tiziana. And I think as uh, our colleague uh, pra Pragian, fr yeah, from, uh, you know, who presented the forest and farm facility, 
has made really very beautifully the link with the session before regarding the UN decade to act and the solutions are here. Maybe we should have more farm facility farms, uni uh, you know, uh, facilities in every country connected together. So thank you so much for this. And also to Mamadou and to Shah for the great overview and the good news you are bringing. Mamadou with the good news related to the, uh, the wood energy program in 10 countries in Africa. Big applause. <laughs> and Shah also for the great work that you are doing in harnessing and gathering the information on what is going on with the wood energy and mainly charcoal production also in Africa to start putting the dots together because there is a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, practices out there and implemented by so many partners from local to national to regional and international and we need really to get this all together to serve us after in decision making. So thank you very much. Now, let me have, uh, let's say, the honor and the pleasure to call to the, to the stage fantastic panelists that are coming, that will be, let's say, lightening us with different experiences, practices that they are really implementing in the, with the communities on the ground and also through different regions, uh, within the region, th through different countries. So I would like to call to the stage Sung Wu Kang from IRENA, please. Joari Nyanya Andrea Mayra Munana, sorry for my bad, uh, let's say, uh, pronunciation, from GIZ from Madagascar. Cecile. My dear Cecile Njebet, the president of the African Women's Network for Community Management of Forests, REFACOF. Please, women, come in to the stage. Diana Kishiki, assistant at Kenya Forest Service. Please, welcome. Veronica Agodoa Kiti, a Aza initiative from Ghana. She will tell us after what, is, uh, what Aza means. And then Humphrey Nchengmua from the Forestry Department of Zambia. Welcome. And last but not least, Cisco Aus from GIZ. Please welcome to the stage. Big applause. We are talking about wood energy and what, what a wonderful energy we have here. So I would like to start actually asking you colleagues to give us uh, actually without any, let's say, without any order, if you can start from here, but nobody is seeing you there. Yes, please, let's, Leah, let's uh, be, Kenya, yeah, I think you see the people. Are you okay? Okay. So I will just take one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I would like to ask you what is to introduce your, uh, yourself briefly and your organization you work for and Tell us exactly what you are doing through your work or, through your, or, or yourself uh, on the linkages between bioenergy and forest landscape restoration. As we know, forest landscape restoration is aiming to put the sectors together in order to support the conservation and sustainable management of resources and, and the recovery of the landscapes across the different land use and here we are talking about energy as sector who normally a sector 
which actually put in more pressure and more degradation. So we want to hear from you, how are you harmonizing FLR with bioenergy? And please introduce yourself first. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Diana Kishiki. I'm an assistant conservator of forests at Kenya Forest Service. Uh, Kenya Forest Service is mandated to conserve and manage forests in Kenya. So how we work with our communities, we support them by giving them technical advice to grow trees on their own farmlands. And through this, uh, they're not over depending on the forest for their wood fuel. And also we have Charcoal Producers Association, which we support and we tell them about how to sustain, uh, sustainably produce charcoal. Yeah, yes, that's it. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please. We need some energy back. They will be given energy, so you, we need energy back. Please, Humphrey. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Humphrey Chengamwa. I work under Forest Department from Zambia. Um, I'm from a country that is 60%, that has 60% forest cover. Uh, and then we have a huge challenge of deforestation. We are, we are losing a forest cover between 250,000 hectares to 300,000 hectares per year. Uh, if you can hear to the figures, I think they are too high. And then 70% um, of the people rely on energy, especially those in the urban areas and then uh, most of the energy that they use it's charcoal so under um, the forest and farm facility uh, 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 with the forestry uh, with food agriculture organization of the un we are working together to curb the situation so what used to happen in the past um, the charcoal producers we are not organized, so it was very difficult to control them. So it was felt imperative that the charcoal producers, they should be mobilized and they create a platform of discussion where they can be uh, discussing things like uh, to do with policy, uh, pricing, uh, investment, and the, the methods of uh, harvesting charcoal. So, these are some of the things that we are doing under the Choma Chaco Association. Because in the past, it was very difficult. It's difficult to follow an individual, but if you bring people, you mobilize them and form an association, it's very difficult to handle the situation. So with the formation of the association, we have seen for the first time where the Chaco producers are being capacity built in various activities, like uh, sustainable methods of charcoal production because in the past they were using the traditional methods that were not sustainable. So under the forest farm facility, we, are, we have introduced the drum method of charcoal production that has low carbon monoxide emission and then uh, the methods of harvesting does not encourage the cutting of bigger trees, we we are encouraging selective methods of uh, uh, producing of uh, se selective methods of harvesting wood. So, in a nutshell, uh, those are some of the things that we are doing under the forest farm facility together with Val. Thank you. Thank you very much, Humphrey. That's very interesting and encouraging. I would like to pass on to Mr. Sungu to tell us a bit, uh, you know, to, to present better himself and also to talk about what Irina is doing on this dialogue between bioenergy and FLR, please. 
Good afternoon. My name is Seung Woo Kang. Uh, I'm working for Arena International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, bioenergy team uh, especially. And then uh, for those who don't know about Arena, Arena is an intergovernmental uh, uh, organization. So we have, we were est established in 2011. And then we have now grown so fast and we have 160 member countries and 23 states in Ascension. We have three offices, one in Abu Dhabi uh, headquarters and the policy, finance and country support unit uh, is in Abu Dhabi. And then one in uh, Bonn in Germany where bioenergy team is located. Uh, we have innovation and technology center. Another office is in New York as a permanent observer to United Nations. So as an intergovernmental organization, we support countries to deploy more renewable energy under the, you know, in, under the context of uh, climate change mitigation and global energy trans transition. So if I summarize a little bit our uh, bioenergy works related to landscape restoration. I can summarize them in two categories. One is to restore the degraded land, and the other is to prevent the land degradation. So, to restoration for the restoration, we have uh, we had one very extensive study to see uh, evaluate the technical and sustainable potential of a biomass while restoring the degraded land. Uh, it was related to AFR 100 uh, pledges. So we, uh, we, sub we assumed that we can plant a short rotation wood copies to restore the land. And then for the other topic, uh, to prevent the degradation of land. So first of all, for the forestry, so sustainable forest management can uh, enhance the use of bioenergy from forest while keeping the forestry growth and keeping also uh, the forest uh, being young. And the other one is sustainable harvest. The, I think you may have heard about this subject, agroforestry, from uh, yesterday. And then agroforestry can help uh, to produce food crops uh, while producing additional bioenergy crops between plots. So it can reduce the, the stress on land use and then it pro produce in the, in the same time the bioenergy, uh, uh, bioenergy commodities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And IRENA stands for this acronym, what it means. ARENA is International Renewable Energy Agency. Thank you very much. It's also for the interpretation. So, Joari, please introduce yourself and tell us what you are doing within GIZ in order to strengthen this collaboration and dialogue between bioenergy and FLR. Please. Thank you, Nora. I know Malakasi name is very difficult. <laughs> uh, my name is Joaren Jamiar Manana, and uh, I work with the German cooperation, GIZ, uh, within uh, sustainable uh, management use of uh, natural resource program. Uh, our main uh, intervention in FLR is to support the forest ministry uh, to implement the country's uh, engagement in the IFR and right uh, initiative uh, to restore 4 million hectares of uh, degraded land by 2030. Uh, our contribution is to, to establish dialogue, uh, intersectoral dialogue, uh, and uh, to, to develop Develop, uh, to develop uh, uh, document uh, framework, legal framework, uh, to implement this uh, engagement in uh, national level and uh, in regional level, uh, we help to uh, to implement also regional uh, plan on bioenergy. Uh, linked this with this the national uh, strategy, uh, FLR strategy. 
Thank you very much, Juari. I turn now to Cecile from Refakov. Please, Cecile. Thank you. I'm Cecile. I'm based in Cameroon. I'm wearing many cats, but uh, this afternoon I will share maybe two or three. I'm coordinating a national NGO in Cameroon. We call it Cameroon Ecology. I will share the, what we're doing within that NGO in relation to bioenergy and uh, uh, forest landscape restoration. I know you know me better with uh, Refakov uh, Heart, uh, the African Women's Network for Community Management of Forests, which is a network of uh, 19 countries now in Africa. And also, I'm um, also a member of the, the steering committee member of the initiative uh, just shared on farm and forest and farm facility of the FAO. What are we doing uh, to try to link uh, bioenergy and forest landscape restoration? We are currently implementing an initiative with uh, C4 on uh, improve um, stove, smoking stove for the women fish smokers in the area, in the mangrove area of Cameroon. And that initiative is really one we can try to encourage because you can see the linkages between the bioenergy. Women need uh, wood from mangrove to, to smoke fish. Women need um, uh, better conditions because so far they are using traditional stove to smoke their fish. But with this initiative, we are, we are bringing the women into restoration of the mangrove because they will cut the mangrove trees to get fuel wood to smoke the fish and they will restore, they will replant where they have cut and they are making it in a very good rotative way. When they, when they use this uh, section this year, they will replant and they will wait for six, seven years to come back. And you, you can see how they link uh, the restoration and, uh, satisfy the, and they try to, to uh, address the need of, of um, uh, wood for, for, for their smoking, for the, to, to smoke their fish. This is first. The second one is that it, this experience or this initiative also, it, it has, it has, it bring in um, the, the, the power relation or the gender, the gender relation between men and women. Uh, mangrove area, as you know, are very difficult to access. So usually what women are doing, they rely on men to have uh, the wood that they, they use to, to, to do the fishing, to smoke their fish. But that uh, relying on them is not an easy relation. Uh, sometimes uh, the men, they cut to go and sell outside where they get more, uh, more money, where it's more expensive than just giving to the women. And you, you see the women turning back to, in cutting very small, very small tree of mangroves. So destroying really those, those trees which are just coming in. That is th the third is also this uh, initiative uh, also address the climate change. You know, when they are, uh, uh, we are improving the stove, uh, the, the, the smoking stove for the women, it's the, 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 the quantity of wood they use, they, have, they use uh, in the past, they were using in the past with the traditional stove, becomes less, though they use less uh, wood because the stove is uh, save more energy, and that is also addressing climate change issues and goes also into what we call adaptation related activities. Not only mitigation in planting trees, but also adaptation in trying to improve their stove, the, the smoking stove they are using. And of course, the last uh, important aspect of this initiative is women empowerment. And how do we see the women empowerment? By introducing, uh, introducing the, uh, uh, the technology, the adapted te technology of uh, improved um, stove, women save time because now they, they don't use, they use, uh, the, the, the stove they are using is um, energy 
uh, uh, save a lot of energy, so the, 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 the smoking of the fish takes less, less time. That's first. They also save, they also improve their, their, their health because they are not smelling or smoking all the smoke coming from the traditional uh, stove. The, the stove now is being, is being improved, so it's producing less smoke, so it's protecting them from being sick. And you see also that the, 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 the surrounding ecosystem where we have a lot of people putting pressure on, 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 the eco on, the, on the wood from mangrove also is getting less and less, so uh, the pressure is also diminishing. And of course, the quality of the fish is better, so the income is, is also uh, improved, the, the level of income, because fish are now more expensive than in the past. So they gain more income, they improve their health, they save time, and they are working in better conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Cecile. An applause to Cecile, because she told us a bit of a story about her initiative and giving actually the great example of the mangroves, where we have also the, the landscapes of the coast, you know, the coastal, the marine, and the, and the land, and, and the value chain, and you know, I am now hungry, I want to eat some fish, smoke it. So anyway, so thank you so much, Cecile, for this, uh, for this experience shared with us. I turn to Veronica, Veronica please. You are from ASA, you have NASA initiative. What is ASA or is it NASA? Please. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Veronica Agodoakiti. I work for ASA initiative. ASA initiative, ASA is alternative sex of assistance. It's our corporate initiative in development. And we have been working since 2009 in developing biochar systems including production of pellets from agricultural residues, stoking for efficient production of cooking energy, and biochar as a byproduct. Biochar can be added to the soil, and as a means of soil amendment, improve land fertility and increase yield. Biochar also serves as a carbon capture and storage. A large biochar stove or kin can be used to produce charcoal efficiently. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. Well done. Now that's a, a very interesting, very concise, but really to the point. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, initiative on biochar. I would like to turn to Cisco House. So Cisco, tell us what are you doing in GIZ in bringing bioenergy and FLR with positive, to, to get positive impacts on the people, on nature. Please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm coordinating a GIZ project just recently started in April this year. It's uh, called Forest Landscape Restoration through the establishment of a sustainable wood energy value chain. Um, it is financed by the BMU, the Federal Ministry of Environment from Germany in the frame of the International Climate Initiative. And yeah, as we heard um, in the second presentation today, um, biomass is still the main source for, for cooking and heating. For heating, probably not in Ghana so much, but um, for cooking. And so it's a, it's a crucial, still a really crucial factor for deforestation and forest degradation in Ghana. And so we want to work on that. And so we are. We are focusing on improving the sustainable wood energy value chain in selected uh, forest landscapes in the northern and central Ghana. So we will work to there together with the local communities um, on the one side on improving the sustainable production of, of uh, fuel wood, um, for example, by supporting afforestation of energy wood plantations but by also by restoring uh, degraded woodland savanna ecosystems. Here we work in close cooperation with IUCN, Aoshan Probenbos. And on the other side, we also like to reduce the demand on, on wood fuel, fuel wood, 
um, by bringing in, for example, more efficient technologies and charcoal production with charcoal kilns or cooking stoves. But you cannot only also focus on the on these landscapes, on these forest landscapes, because uh, sure, also charcoal transportation production um, is is in all over in Ghana. So we also want to look on the national level. So here we're working together with the uh, Ministry of Lands of Natural Resources, Ministry of Energy, Forestry Commission, Energy Commission, and the Environmental Protection Agency, because all of this, all of them, have a significant role when it comes to the establishment of a, a sustainable wood energy value chain. So, so we are trying to sit together with them and supporting them when it comes to the revision, revision or formulation of strategies, regulations, and regarding to bioenergy or forest landscape restoration. Thank, Thank you me. very much. That's really a very interesting project. You are starting, yeah? Yes. You are initiating that. And I think there is a very good also knowledge here from the different, even from Ghana, your sister from Ghana, who has been also working on that and to get also some information and experience from the other colleagues. That's, uh, that's great. No, th thank you so much. Before going back to the other questions that I have, I have so many questions to you guys. No, so many questions. I wanted to give the floor to our audience I am sure you are here all burning to ask questions, comments, maybe contribute with maybe your experience, what works or what doesn't work, and, and then we can hear after from, from the panelists. So I have a hand here, a second, third, I don't see, four, five. So please, can I have the mic here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Kreto Ndikumagenge. I am working for FAO in Democratic Republic of Congo. I would like to congratulate my colleagues here for uh, the job done. Uh, but I have a question to the senior person in charge of uh, energy and uh, my colleague from Zambia. Uh, because since many years, uh, we, are go we are trying to improve the yield of production. If you see 70% of the wood is gone to charcoal, but the yield of uh, efficiency is very low. In many countries, it is around 10 or 15%. Uh, it is very low. So the, the rate of wood is low somewhere. So could we share with us some experience of a project that we can use as an example to improve the yield of production? Because in DRC, we are starting integrated red programs in Equatorial province, and we have a big, big component on energy. If we can, as FAO, show that how can we improve uh, this uh, yield of production to be a good contribution to the country, to the red for landscape restoration also at national level and landscape level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will take the other questions, and then after we come back to you for responses. Okay, there was, yes, the hand raised there. And then the third, just behind, after, yeah? All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Daniel Dokuninote. Uh, I work with a local NGO called Yampuano in the western region of Ghana. Uh, I would like to ask a question and also make some contributions. Uh, basically, I've been working with Mango Ecosystem for the past six years. And we realized that mangrove is being used by the women, like fishmongers for smoking and they really like the taste. When it comes to Ghana, they like the taste and also the color. But when my sister was talking, she made mention of the harvesting and then replanting. Are there plans to also look at sustainable harvesting? Because there are ways you could harvest some trees and leave the others where the system can regenerate by itself. And if they are replanting, I also want to know how they are doing it. Are they doing in situ or they do nursery and all that? Okay, thank you. There was a hand just, yes, there, behind, yeah. My name is uh, Raymond Usuachan, working with Conservation Alliance International. I want to add to what uh, mother colleague said. Um, once you are doing um, restoration, it's like you are doing it on a rotation basis. And can you explore the opportunity of maybe getting 
uh, community resource uh, areas around the uh, mangrove area so that at least uh, you don't um, burden uh, the mangroves a lot so that areas will be set aside whereby it will be managed sustainably. Then the other question is, um, uh, when you talk about the improved stove, can we give us, um, uh, in terms of maybe uh, avoided degradation using the traditional system and then the new ones, the, new, the improved stove, so that at least we can make comparison and see whatever is going on. Thank you. There were hands here. Yes. Here first. Please. Yeah. And then behind and then there. Yeah. Please. Okay. Good afternoon to you. I'm Yaira Yautashiyama, a Ghanaian. Yes. Um, I'd like to know, we, uh, we are all talking about um, charcoal, that's wood fuel, wood fuel. I'd like to know, what are we doing to replace them? Because this forum itself is for land restoration and we know with trees, it takes a very long time for trees to grow or to mature to a particular level before they will be cut for firewood or charcoal. But here lies the case with charcoal, you use them and you have to use them, them again. What are the various steps we are putting in place that after cutting them, we need to replace them for others to use? If there is no step or if there is nothing we have in mind, I would like to suggest that we look at the LPGs and other things and also making it affordable for those in the interior as interior parts of the country to get access to. And also there is a woman I know in the north who uses um, wool, uh, silk, to help um, the women to cook. They just boil and put it in a pot, like the wool, for it to, to boil. So I think we can also look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, there was the hand there, yeah, behind, and then, and then to the right, yeah, with the white shirt. Thanks. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kafu Yagbe uh, from WIPA, that is Young Professionals for Agriculture Development. Um, as young as we are, we want to know to all the panelists sitting there, what are the sustainable strategies that have been made to engage the youth within this um, bioenergy? Because we, the young people, are the ones going to use the energy, and we, if we are not integrated very well, we'll still destroy it, and restoration cannot be achieved. Thank you very much. The hand behind, yeah, please. Good afternoon. My name is Hubert Igbert Isel. I work for Sustainable Energy Technologies and EcoNexus. Um, my contribution is more of a suggestion or a contribution and answers to some of my colleagues who actually ask questions. Um, I would like to say that um, one of the panelists presenters um, talked about alternative for um, charcoal, right? So I would like to say that the way to go, because there are other means where we can get charcoal or biofuels without cutting down trees at all. For example, um, I'm a briquetting and um, pellet expert, so we could Instead of cutting down trees, we could make charcoal briquettes from coconut husk. We could make it from rice husk, um, biomass materials. We could make it from vegetables and a whole lot. Even, um, what's the name, um, 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 waste food. So um, I think we should be looking more at um, um, making um, biofuels or bioenergy fuels more from the biomass materials than cutting down trees. And also, um, um, talking about bioenergy and biofuels, um, there's other alternative like um, making, um, what's the name? Cooking gels from ethanol, right? So like cassava or sugarcane, you could extract, make the ethanol, you add um, a chemical to it, then you get a gel which you could use for cooking, which is more sustainable than um, charcoal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will take another hand here and then I, I yes, here and here. And then we go back to the audience at least to respond and then we can have, can have a conversation. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Samuel from Nigeria. 
I just wanted to talk about um, the export of charcoal from most African countries to Europe. I was in um, the UK some time ago and I saw a certified charcoal from Namibia. So uh, what is most government, I know someone is here from um, Zambia, what is government doing as regards and the way to regulate export? Because there's also a lot of driving forces from outside um, the continent driving the export of charcoal. And I know there's also a lot of illegal export of charcoal from Africa to other countries, both in Europe and in Asia. So what is government doing? And probably the FAO also could also speak on that as regards, are there regulations to stop the export of charcoal from Africa? Thank you very much. I will take yeah, the sir in, in, with the hat, red hat, please. Good afternoon. I'm Justice Ankuma Bafo from CSIR. Uh, the issue about charcoal, uh, one concern is that uh, wood are being used for biofuel because they are available everywhere to those who use it. Availability is a key. And they, they can access it anywhere. My question to the panel is that, uh, is there any alternative way which uh, any of the panel have considered to as, a, as an alternative way which is more available or which will be available to the users instead of uh, the wood or biofuel? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we will stop here the questions. There are so many questions, comments, contributions. I would first maybe give the floor to Shah, first to just uh, respond to some of the questions that were addressed to him, then to Cecile about the mongrels, and then I will go back to all of you because I'm sure you have some responses and comments related to your wonderful experiences in the countries and in the region. Shah, please. Yes. It's good to know. Uh, aside uh, charcoal is a concern, uh, and uh, I observe that so many no questions relevant to charcoal. Yes, it is a concern to me as well. And the first question about the charcoal production efficiency in the case of Zambia. Uh, While well, during this wood to charcoal conversion process, and uh, more than 80% of the wood get lost in terms of mass, more than 60% get lost in terms of energy. So if the current the production efficiency says about 15%, I mean it's normally just 10 to 20%, if 15% is the potential to get to 30%, then you can save half the wood. This is very significant. Now the, the technology is there already. And the, FAO published one, in, so one publication called the Simple Charcoal Production Technologies in, in 1980s. It is one of the most downloaded FAO publication. I mean, this is not really a high technology. It's just a change in the charcoal king building and the operations of the king. Why people do not use it? With such a simple technology improvement, they can get a better, better quality and better productivity, the investment. And people do not have the incentive to invest into the so-called the improved charcoal. I mean, people will go there, cut the wood, stack it, burn to get the charcoal go. And if you have a king there, that means it's a kind of a relatively long term. I mean, not think about the investment itself, but you no, know, the charcoal king will be there. They will not, not so move flexible as, as before. And, and the cost of ch wood input is really not high enough. I mean, they do not pay much of the wood. So the incentive is kind of weak. This is, you know, we have this kind of information available, and we also look into this kind of charcoal transition, which I, put, uh, put, uh, I have uh, put some 
some copies there. If you want to take a look, the charcoal transition, talking about the efficiency in both the French and English. We have the incentives of sustainable wood energy in sub-Saharan Africa, also available there. And if you could not find it, just check the FAO wood energy that is available there electronically. Thank you. I want to respond quickly before Cecile. Okay, hand free, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I'll be very brief and fast because the people had asked a lot of questions. Um, the first one was, what are we doing to restore, to restore trees? Uh, under the FFF, uh, there are so many activities that uh, we are doing. Um, Zambia, we are blessed with the, the Miombo forest. The Miombo forest is re regenerate. So we are encouraging natural regeneration among the communities. And then um, secondly, as I said, in the past, the charcoal producers were not organized. So we mobilized them and formed associations. And there are groups at the community level, so it has been easy for us to make follow-ups to them. For the first time it has happened, where the charcoal producers themselves, they are able to establish a hoodlot of a hectare. It's only that last year we were hit by drought, so the seedlings that we are given to them, most of them dried. But in 2017, we had the, a good number of the charcoal producers that had the, planted the uh, eucalyptus grandis to improve on the wood stock. Uh, those are some of the activities that we are doing to to, to, to restore the forest. And then with the, the issue of study circles, um, study circle is a participatory method where between seven to six people would come together and they would discuss the challenges that are, they are facing in terms of wood and charcoal in the community and themselves they will come up with the solutions on how to handle the problems that they are facing. And then the second one was, um, was, on, was on the yield of efficiency uh, of charcoal. I think it was from Congo. Yes, I would agree with you. Even at the time when we were, when we were um, because most of the communities they are using the traditional method. Uh, also the recovery rate, when you are using the traditional method, it's at 10% of biomass and then 90% all goes to waste. But with the Casamance, the drum kiln, the recovery rate is at 35%, between 30 to 35% recovery rate of biomass. And then you'll find that to those that are using the traditional method, the kiln, it will take seven to 10 days to burn. But with the drum kiln, you are able to harvest within three to four days. In economical terms, you have other things to do. And then with the drum kiln, you use selective method of uh, cutting, where you encourage the community to select branches and not to cut the whole tree. Uh, this, those are some of the things that we are doing on, uh, on that one. And then he, there was the, a colleague who had said the trees is not the way to go. Uh, I'm afraid I'll speak from the technical point of view. And then he, we have been so much in contact with the, the community. And then he, I'll speak of Zambia and what goes on at the community level. Uh, most of uh, Chaco has been painted to, with a lot of negativities. Uh, you, you know, sometimes I would joke with the, uh, the people that we, we work with to say, is it because Chaco is black and anything to do with black is bad? Uh, you, you get the point. So um, most of the livelihood of the rural people uh, is derived from Chaco because wood is close to them. Charcoal 
is able to send a child to school after you sell a bag. Chaco in the rural area is able to save someone's life where you sell a bag of charcoal and you are able to buy medicine. Charcoal is able to buy a pencil and a book for someone that is in the rural area because I can assure you income is not easy to come by in the rural areas. So uh, instead of saying charcoal is bad, it's better that we promote sustainable charcoal production, which is possible, where we look at the present and focus in, in the future. If we say, today, this is the way it is, 20 years from now, how would we want it to be? Then, can we bring the charcoal producers on board and then begin bringing in these initiatives like um, establishment of woodlot, natural regeneration, capacity building them, so that, you know, because the illiterate the levels among the charcoal producers is very low. So if you leave them behind, then there's nothing that we are doing. But if we bring them on board and create a platform of discussion and discussing their issues which they know best and the solutions they know them, they will be able to achieve sustainable charcoal production. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I understand your passion, and I understand, of course, that charcoal is there and is there to, uh, still to stay, but of course, sustainable production is very important, organization is very important, sustainable management of forests is important, restoration is important, but as also other colleagues were saying, we should also have other renewable uh, alternatives, because the forest will never be able to respond to all the demand because it's not just the demand of the people in the rural area but also the people in the urban areas and so on so we need to find trade-offs i want to give the floor to um yes please so from kenya to thank you okay i would like to respond to the question of youth involvement um, yes, we are the next generation that we need to take up some of these initiatives. But I guess we can get involved, like bringing, uh, we have like the improved charcoal kilns, which we can be involved in making them, and also having like three nursery establishments which can promote also uh, reforestation. So in one way or the other, as much as we, we don't take up because it's a black, okay, say, like my colleague has said, it's black, so most of the youth are like, no, I cannot handle it. It's, it's like it's that. But this is some of the way that we can get involved as youth. And again, uh, charcoal, as Humphrey has said, charcoal, like for in instance, Kenya, it comes from the dryland forest. We are promoting the growing of Prosopis juliflora. It has high calorific value. And it's high, it regenerates highly. So we cannot say it will get depleted of what, no. It's something that is there. Thank you. Yeah, tell me about the prosopis. There were so many problems also in different countries of inv invasiveness and so on. So everything, I would like to, let's say to just, because we have still maybe 10 minutes and then five minutes for the closing, for the wrap up. I wanted just to give you, to give the other colleagues the panelists to ask you, of course, while responding to the questions that speak more to you, if you could give, you know, one good practice that you think could respond to the comments from other, from the colleagues. So, you have not responded yet, yeah? Please. Uh, thank you for very interesting questions. I heard one, I want to reply to the question about the alternatives. Okay. So for the sustainable biomass, charcoal should be produced in sustainable way. So here we have this forestry expert. The sustainable forest management can help to uh, increase the sustainability of charcoal production and consumption. For the alternatives, I mean biofuel, uh, liquid biofuels, are not necessarily sustainable. So let's 
let me explain the link between the bioenergy production and forestry uh, FLR, uh, landscape restoration. If we need more bioenergy from these alternatives, liquid biofuel can be produced from cassava, which is the case in Africa, like in Zambia, they are producing uh, bi liquid biofuel, bioethanol, especially from uh, cassava. If we need to produce certain amount of bioethanol, then we need to produce also the feedstock. So it means we need expansion of uh, bioenergy production uh, land. So it will induce also the land conversion from pasture land or maybe forest land. So the alternative should be also produced in sustainable way. And uh, the, 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 for the sustainable habit thing, the agroforestry can help uh, these practices. Uh, this is one point that I want to make. So we can produce uh, the food crops on the same amount of land with increased yield by nitrogen fixing wood crops, rotation wood crops, and it can also reduce the use of a fertilizer, and then it will give you additional biomass. So the use of the biomass is important. So uh, what I want to recommend is we can produce lots of uh, wide spectrum of bioenergy, but we should have this ecosystem of bioenergy production. We can produce additional bioenergy from agroforestry or from cassava, bioethanol, etc. but we should know, we should ensure the use of this energy and the, the application of these practices, sustainable forestry management or the production of liquid biofuel, agroforestry practices, they are not free. So we should ensure the market, we should find the market, and the ecosystem between producer and consumer should be well established to uh, promote the sustainable bioenergy production and also the landscape restoration. Thank you very much, thank you. I would like to turn to our colleague from Madagascar, Juari. So, what do you think? What would be the best practice that you could recommend or also respond to your to other colleagues from the audience. Uh, thank you, Nola. Uh, I will take the opportunity to add some, some uh, information about our program. Uh, because uh, I said in the national level, we, we contribute to the legal framework about FLR and bioenergy. But uh, another uh, complement in the, in the regional level, we we help also to, to put in place uh, a, a large scale of reforestation uh, with uh, uh, improvement of uh, improved uh, kilns and uh, for uh, produ producer, producer and uh, improved store for customers. Uh, for us, the, the, the best practices of this uh, large uh, the, this, uh, wood energy reforestation is based on uh, uh, individual participatory, but also uh, to by putting in place uh, the to the land tenure uh, security for the for the community, uh, so that uh, they, they 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 are they with this uh, this uh, this uh, land tenure uh, approaches. Uh, uh, they, they, they can, they, they are on no ownership of the reforestation and also we, we help them not only on the reforestation but in all of the, the value chain and I think that the, the, the case, the, uh, this, uh, this act of supporting in the, all the, the chain of the, of the uh, charcoal, the, the value chain of the wood energy uh, so that you can you can improve the the, the livelihood uh, because they 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 are involved on the plantation, but after they can produce uh, sustainable char charcoal. We we, we call it green charcoal with uh, the best price in the in the market, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, also the link the the link. Within uh, FLR is uh, now uh, FLR is about to restore functionality. Uh, we 
if you um, uh, produce our CU plant uh, for wood energy, we, we need also to, to find uh, another way to restore some of our uh, functionality, not only for the wood energy, but to, to put so the, the plantation uh, uh, the, to have a mosaic, mosaic of plantation uh, so that we, we can, in an, uh, another hand, have the energy but also to improve some functionality from the community. Yeah. Thank you very much, Juari. Maybe before going to Cecile uh, regarding the mangrove, I wanted to hear also more about from Veronica because you have not had, uh, let's say, the opportunity to talk about the practices you are really promoting in your initiative, in your other initiative. Thank you. Um, if we want actually to establish a mutual relationship between forest landscape restoration and bioenergy use, then the method that we should adopt should ensure an efficient energy access with less dependent on the uh, what, forest use. And uh, if you we talk about the voucher and the technology, the voucher technology uh, promotes less uh, dependent on wood for energy. And uh, it helps also with efficient energy access and also has value addition. This value addition, which is the voucher, it helps to improve the soil fertility and increase the yield of the soil and also promotes forest regeneration. And wherever we have uh, these degraded and toxic lands as a result of the surface mining, Baucha has proved to re bring back this destroyed land back to life because Baucha has the cap capacity or ability to remove the toxic element in the soil and prevent the plants from absorbing this toxic element and also the runoff of these toxic elements and the heavy metals into the water bodies. So in short, Baucha is a very promising technology if you are talking about energy access and forest regeneration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. That's very good. Cecile, please, uh, you had so many questions yeah. regarding the mangroves, regarding you know, why you do restoration instead of doing sustainable management of, uh, of the mangroves, and, and how do you do restoration, and uh, maybe nurseries. There were some questions for you yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the questions. Some are also uh, comment and um, recommendation that we have to take into account. But globally, uh, doing um, mangrove restoration does not prevent from uh, doing um, uh, sustainable harvesting. I think they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. We are promoting restoration while helping, uh, uh, assisting also our training people to get into sustainable management because the, the whole issue is to have the sustainable management of everything that we are doing. So even in the, in the, in the stove, we are exploring the best, the, best, uh, the best quality that will fit into the need of the, of the women uh, uh, fish smokers. What is the, the, the stove that will guarantee the quality of the fish, the taste, the color, uh, will save time, and we have uh, also have a good calorific uh, uh, um, power. So we have to look for all those criteria before we can say this is the best. So far, it's not excluding totally the traditional stove, but it's improving the traditional stove because that's where we're going to. And the key uh, uh, advantage we have is that it's a multi-stakeholder group which is working, partnership. We have universities with the young, young uh, students in the university who are interested in bioenergy that are part of the project as the universities. We have um, these private people also, and we have the communities themselves, and we have other partners. So it's just for us, how best can we get mangrove uh, stand uh, for, for long and satisfy the need of the population? 
somebody was saying we don't, we don't need to cut trees. It, it's, it's difficult to say so. It's difficult to tell the community that don't cut trees, don't cut mangrove, where they are living in the mangrove area and they have no alternative. But we, what we are doing is really uh, um, taking them slowly, slowly towards nursery and also natural regeneration. It's not excluded. They are making also nurseries, replanting from nursery, but also keeping aside some pl places for natural regeneration. Thank so you. it's a, a multi, it's a huge, let's say, sustainable diverse management, range yeah, yes, of thing. management yeah. to go to the sustainable management of, of our mangrove, but also to improve the livelihood of the community because uh, restoration only for restoration will not serve the purpose of the communities. Thank you Thank so you. much, Cecile, for your responses. I would like to give the floor to Cisco, maybe last comment or a response of any, okay. uh, just uh, one minute. Okay. I'll try it in one minute. Um, yeah, I think what, what uh, the alternatives uh, biofuels have in common with uh, sustainable produced charcoal, for example, produced in a, in a wood fuel uh, plantation or in an improved charcoal kiln, is that they are still not competitive to the locking of trees in the natural forest and production on traditional kilns. So I think that's what we have to work on it. <coughs> and that, <coughs> sorry. that can be on different levels, methods, for example, on the national level by law enforcement, uh, tax revenue systems or um, financial subsidies, uh, labeling of uh, certified, char certified charcoal, but also in the communities, we have to see what approaches are the best one because conditions and demands can verify even between one community to the next, even between one farmer to the next. So we really have to see also there what is the best approach. Uh, can it be agroforestry there or maybe a community managed uh, wood fuel plantation? And that's where we have to be. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm pressing you because uh, we actually reached a bit uh, the time. So it's a very, very complex subject, very passionate subject. And uh, I think you said that we need to, to close for the wrap up. I don't know. Five, we, we got five minutes more. Okay, so I will take you because you have been insisting, but I don't want the others to insist, please. Don't put me in a bad situation. So can I give you this? Thank you very much. Um, I'm Julius Nkansa Nyako um, from Energy Commission, and I'm in charge of bioenergy. Uh, once I'm here, I want to address some of the issues that um, some of the people have raised, and I'll be very quick. Um, it's not that uh, we don't know the issues uh, pertaining to the cutting out trees for charcoal production, etc. But then we know that good fuel use is our primary Wood fuel is used as a primary cooking fuel. But then we've decided to regulate the entire wood fuel value chain. So we are looking at shifting from the normal production of charcoal or wood fuel to the sustainable ways of doing it. And we've got the regulations in place. We've developed it. We are engaging the various stakeholders to finalize it and get it passed by parliament. But then we are not doing that in isolation. We are looking at the um, promotion of LPG. Government policy is to increase the use of LPG from the current 25% level to 50% level. So we are also working in that uh, direction. We mentioned cook stoves. We've worked and we developed, developed standards for improved cook stoves. And we are turning that standards into regulations to make that enforceable. We are hoping that all these uh, three regulations I've talked about would be finalized next year. And then we will see, those of you who know the, how in each commission we've brought efficiency in the appliance market, you will see that our cook stoves that are available in Ghana will come in efficient levels. So whether it's one star, two star, three star, well, the way you see our refrigerators and air conditioners, we have the uh, all that. And lastly, we, also, we are also reviewing 
our nurse energy policy to include most of these things. And we've got all the strategies that will put together um, the various um, facets of our energy requirements. Um, I think I did two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's the Energy Commission for Ghana, is that right? Yes, thank you so much, Ghana, for your responses and your clarification to the questions that we had today. Of course, it's a very, as I said, complex issue, and we cannot just tackle it just with this one hour and a half. There is a lot to say, a lot to share, and I think we have just wanted to create this opportunity for exchanges, information, connection. And you have our experts here from the countries, from the different organizations. So please, if you are really interested to get more into details with them, so don't hesitate after, after this session, uh, during the break. What I just learned, and then I will leave, of course, the floor to my colleague, uh, Tiziana, to give a bit of wrap up and the next steps. What I learned is that really, as from the FLR point of view, the forest and landscape restoration, which also look at the well-being and the socioeconomic benefits. So we need to stop, I think, thinking of restoration only about the land. It's the whole value chains, from land, from seed, to the end product, the market, whether it is local, whether it is national, whether it is international, and looking at the sustainability in a very comprehensive way from the sustainability, sustainable management of the forest, but, or, or the different woodlots or woodlands, but also the sustainability and the efficiency of the uh, product, uh, let's say the charcoal production, and also consumption. So I think it has been really very much, uh, you know, uh, interesting for me to learn more. I am not an expert on, on wood energy and charcoal, so it was really very, very nice to hear your experiences. So I will leave the floor. I thank you so much. A big applause to our panelists. And I want to give back the, the, the mic to my colleague Tiziana to lead us to the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nora. And uh, uh, yes, uh, just to say that today has been itself a very positive experience. And as Nora said, has created good connections for us to go ahead. And uh, we cannot ignore the fact that charcoal and fuel food are part of the tradition of Africa. So we can think to other alternatives, but we should improve these value chains. And uh, uh, because this is part of the African beings, it, this is part of this population. So I think that we have heard uh, several uh, uh, interesting opportunities for doing this. We heard about improved technologies and uh, short rotation copies, agroforestry techniques, uh, and uh, improved forest management practices. So I think that we should, uh, we will uh, summarize all these best practices uh, in the uh, minutes of, the, uh, of today's session. And uh, I'm grateful to all the ones from the audience that have contributed also via uh, Slido. We will uh, take note of uh, all your contribution and we will go ahead uh, sharing knowledge on this uh, uh, very important uh, uh, topic. Uh, we have already planned a further dialogue uh, at international uh, uh, level, uh, probably in Addis Ababa next year uh, in uh, um, March or April. And uh, we have planned activities at national level uh, a, a national dialogue on uh, sustainable uh, wood energy and forest landscape restoration integrated system will be held here in uh, Accra at the mid of December and uh, in Lomé in uh, Togo soon next year. Uh, and uh, the Forest Farm Facility has already planned a national policy dialogue to establish a charcoal producers association here in Ghana uh, in the first uh, quarter of next year. The government of Zambia has already planned another initiative, the Zambia Charcoal Indaba, to be held in March 2020. 
And again, the Forest Fund facility will organize a sub-regional exchange event amongst producers, practitioners, and policymakers in cooperation with C4 and other partners. So let me uh, conclude this interactive session by saying that uh, um, all these persons here, all our panelists, represents the change, and all of us represents the change that we have been waiting for. So we should act uh, right now, and we should change right now to um, improve uh, the situation as it is. Uh, let me thank all of you for having participated, all the panelists, and uh, I don't want to forget all the people that have contributed to organize this uh, um, wonderful session. First of all, Anitra that is here, but also other person that has, uh, uh, couldn't join at the last minute. And uh, uh, so uh, thanks to all, and uh, uh, thanks for coming, and enjoy your next session. Thank you.